Matthew uh, chapter, I believe it's 15, verses 15 through 20, yes, says this. It says, then Peter said to Jesus, explain to us the parable that says people aren't defiled by what they eat. Don't you understand yet, Jesus asked. Anything you eat passes through the stomach and then goes into the sewer. But the words you speak come from the heart. That's what defiles you. From from your heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, all sexual immorality, theft, lying, and slander. These are what defile you. Eating with unwashed hands will never defile you. If you were new here for the first time when I, when I read this passage, Jesus was in an argument with religious people because they were getting mad because they weren't, the disciples weren't doing this ceremonial washing of hands this religious duty that they had, and they weren't doing it. And so they were getting mad at Jesus. And Jesus clapped back and said, well, hey, you're getting mad about washing of hands, but let me tell you something. There's a deeper issue that you have. And he starts talking about the heart. And he says that everything flows from the heart. Everything flows. And he starts talking about what flows from the heart because the heart without God produces things that God never intended for your life. A heart without God will produce the very things you just read. Evil, evil thoughts, murder. All these things, lying, all these things are produced when you don't have God at the center of your life. And that's just some things. There are more things that are produced when God isn't the center. When God is not the one leading you. When you say things like, oh, you should just go whatever your your heart desires. What you're saying is that you go above God. And God is no longer Lord of your life. But if you can live a life surrendered to God, it will produce something so much more better for you that it will help you to last this life that you're living. Too many people, struggles, claws, strive, all these things, when God never meant for them to live a life like that. In fact, God wants you to live with joy and peace self-control, everything that the Spirit wants to produce. He wants to do the very opposite of what other people are going through. And it is very, very possible, church, to live this life. You don't have to battle the whole, your whole life. You don't have to live and just be like, you know, I'm just going to battle this until my time comes. No, you can actually live in victory every single day until God comes or you die. You can live in peace. You can live with joy. You can live without anxiety and depression and popped, hopped up on pills all the time because you're trying to deal with something that only God can heal you from. You can actually live that life through Jesus Christ. It is very possible. You don't have to battle like that. You don't have to feel like you're in this war and you can't seem to, to catch a break every single day. You can actually, it is very possible. That's why that's how my message is this. As we end this series, that the war is over. The war is over. The war was over 2,000 years ago when Jesus came and died on the cross for me and you. Jesus. And now because of Jesus' death, me and you can live from that place of victory. And when hard times come, we have the power of God to overcome it. We have the power of God to get through it. Not just get through it, but overcome it. To pass, just to simply live a life that is flowing different from before. And so the question is, how do we win the war of our heart? How do we live a continuously victorious life, a transformed heart? Because if your heart is not transformed, church, you will continue to live in the cycle that you're living. And here's the thing, we keep forgetting this every single time, that it's not just going to affect you, it's going to affect your marriage, it's going to affect your children, it's going to affect every single person around you. If God doesn't heal you, no one else will. No one else will. Because it's not about a pers- another person. Oh, if it's just, I find the right person. If I divorce this, I'll find some better. It's not about, man, if I can go live somewhere else, it'll be better. It's not about if I can just get more money. It'll, it's none of those things that are external that people usually go to is going to fix your heart. Only God can do that. Because what happens? You get the promotion. 
You get the X amount of money, but you're still unhappy because your heart's not healed. What happens? Oh, you get this. You get a new relationship. You get all these things, but you're still unhappy. You're still controlling. You're still dealing. See what I mean? You still, you get the thing that everybody else wants to get, but internally you're still dying. Internally, you're still the same person. If you're a person that is constantly frustrated and you get a new relationship and God, you never allow God to heal you, you're going to bring your frustrations into your new relationship. Your new friendships, marriage. If you're a person that is constantly angry, you got anger problems, and you don't allow the Lord to heal your heart, what's going to happen? Anger is going to get into every area of your life. It's going to affect people. So it doesn't matter what you get externally. I'm not saying it's bad to get a promotion. I'm not saying it's bad to get the bag. I'm not saying it's bad. None of that is bad. But if you think that that is your source of healing, you are greatly mistaken. And my job is to help you not fall into that trap. Whether you leave this place loving me or hating me, I'm going to help you the very best that I can. But that is not going to be the source of your healing. So how do we win? How do we stay victorious? Number one is this. Can you put it up there? Is that we need to learn to receive God's love. That sounds so easy, right? Like, well, yeah, God loves me. Because if you grew up in church, you heard that for years and years and years. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. We're about to go on Tuesday to this frontera tour that says God loves you frontera tour. And before you know it, it almost becomes cliche. But here's the thing. If we don't know how to receive God's love, we will always feel not enough. It will affect our relationship with God. Because if I don't know how to receive God's love for me personally, I'm always going to strive and claw my way to think that I need to do something so that God can love me. Or I'm always going to be upset when I don't get it right with God. Or I'm always going to be just, man, God, I failed you. You know what, God? You know what? I just, or I don't think this church thing is for me. I, I can't, it just, I can't get it right. You need to learn to, you're, me and you are supposed to live our life based out of his love. That is the foundation that we live off of. It's God's love for me. And I live off of the love of God. I live off of that. Do I make mistakes? Yeah, I make mistakes. But I don't say, oh, I'm no longer in the love of God anymore. No. It's kind of like when I said it two Sundays ago when we talked about repentance and I showed you the example of the difference between I'm sorry, because, but you don't really mean it, and how you go backwards, but I repent and I go forward and I keep going and I'm not going backwards. It's the same thing with God's love. I repent. God is forgiving me. I give my life to God and I'm going forward. I'm going forward in my life. I trip up. There's things that happen. I made a mistake. But you know what God's love does? It allows me to get back up and keep going to the direction that he has for me. This is what the Bible says about the love of God. If you go to, I'm not going to read John 3, 16. Some of you already thought that. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 18 through 19. Can you put up there real quick for them? This is what Paul says. Paul says this, and all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ Jesus. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. Stop right there. What is he saying? That when Jesus died on the cross, he brought us back to himself. In other words, I was separated from God and there was no other way to pay. And Jesus said, I'll stand in the gap and I'll take on everything so that you can come back with me. 
because I love you and I'm reconciling my relationship with you and other people. Jesus brought, paid the price, church, so that me and you can live a new life through him and never separate it again from him. Jesus took on all the sin of the world, all the curses of the world. The Bible says that he took it all on the cross so that me and you can experience a new life. That's real love. He paid the price for me and you and brought us back to himself. In other words, I love you enough to do what I have to do so that you don't have to be away from me anymore. Jesus knew, even on the cross, he knew humanity was going to fail. He knew there was going to be a time where you were going to reject him. He knew there was going to be a time where you didn't understand and you didn't get it. And you were hard-headed and you were stubborn in a certain way. He knew all that, yet he stepped in and died for you anyways. Because there, here's the thing, if you're new to church, the only way that people could ever be right with God was through a priest. And through a dead, they had to sacrifice dead animals. We don't have to do that anymore, thank God. It'd be weird for you to walk into church and, Pastor Sam, why is there a dead animal at the altar? And it smells very bad in here. We don't have to do any of that stuff anymore. The Bible says that when Jesus died, he tore the veil, and now me and you have access to God. I can go to God whenever I want. I don't got to sacrifice an animal. That's why they call Jesus the Lamb of God, because he was the ultimate sacrifice for me and you. Jesus said, I, God said, I love you so much, I'm going to send my son so that he can pay the price for you. And because he does all of this, our response is simply, God, I give you my life. My response to God's love is, Lord, I receive your love. Now I give you my life. John said it best in 1 John. If you could put it up there. He said this, talking about living for God. He said, we know we love God's children if we love God and obey his commands. Loving God means keeping his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. His commandments are not burdensome. John said this. This is John talking about us responding to God's love. He's not saying, because this is how people live many times without them even noticing. He's not saying you have to work for God and work and live under God and obey God's commandments so that God can love you. He's saying God loves you already, therefore I live and obey his commandments. Because you already love me, God, I might as well, I, because you love me, God, I'm going to live under your commandments. I'm going to obey you. In other words, I'm not motivated by fear. I'm motivated by love. Because what happens? When we are fear-based, we do things to try to get God to approve of us. To God, God, look at me. I did this. Can you love me? God, look at me. I did that. Will you love me? And we live in this working relationship where I'm trying to work for God's love. And God says, I already loved you. And that's it. And your response is, okay, God, thank you for loving me. Therefore, I live for you. I'll do anything for you because of what you've done for me. It's like my daughter, Catalina. My daughter doesn't have to work for my love. I love her. Whether she obeys me or she doesn't. Whether she throws a tantrum or she doesn't. Don't let that cute face fool you sometimes. I love her anyways. It's not going to change. I love, I will do anything for my, I, you know, I used to hear people talk about that. Like, oh, parents would always say like, oh, I would die for you. And I always thought like, yeah, 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 that's very nice of you. But now that I have my daughter, it's like, oh, now I know what it means. To literally feel like I would rather, if I had to give my life, I would give my life for my daughter. Regardless. And that's how God loves me and you. Whether you get it right or you don't, I love you. I tell my daughter I love her every day. Whether she gets it right or she doesn't, I love her. She's my daughter. Same thing. God loves you. 
And therefore you respond with God, because I love you, I'll follow you. Because you did all this. You stood in the gap for me. I'll live for you. But it starts with receiving God's love and understanding that you are loved and that your life is based and lives off a place of love. It's not God as an old man, Gandalf looking, trying to get you every single time or Dumbledore looking kind of person. It's not, that's not it. He's sitting on the throne. He's the king of kings and lords of lords. And he loves you. But you got to learn to receive it. You got to learn. Ever met someone that has a hard time receiving good things? You ever met anybody like that? Your tia, your crazy aunt, whatever. They have a hard time receiving anything good. Like it's, it's uncomfortable. And it's because maybe they just don't feel like they deserve it. Or they feel like, or maybe they're like, why are you doing this? Or they feel like there's a catch. Is there a catch to this? Like, why are you being good to me? And they have a hard time receiving it. If we're not careful, or maybe you're like that, it's going to bleed into your relationship with God where you feel like you can't receive anything from him. And my desire is that that would end today. That you can fully live knowing I'm loved. I'm loved. I'm loved. Second point is this. If you want to live a victorious life, a transformed heart, you need to have a desire for increase of God. A desire. Your desires are what's going to give the direction of your life. They dictate the direction of your life. They start with your desires. Your desire will determine the direction of your life. And desires are not totally bad. The problem with desires and the reason why they go down the hole is because either they will be God-centered or self-centered. And that's where desires can get sticky and messy. But desire in itself is not bad. It's just, where is it going? Is it God-centered where I live with a desire to please God? And say, God, because you love me and I love you, I desire you more and I want to live? Or is it I am self-centered so I will do things to get what I want regardless of how other people feel, care, or whatever their opinions are? It could be self-centered. And the only person that can determine that is you. I can't determine it for you. But desires can be either God-centered or self-centered. God created us with a desire. And when he created humanity, it was a desire. It was supposed to be a desire for him and his will. And when sin came in and disobedience came in, it broke that. And that is why you find self-centeredness and selfishness and all these things that were produced. But when God first created man and woman... It was to have a desire, a relationship with God. When me and you have self-centered desires, it captures our heart and produces things that God never intended for you to have. It's not because God is punishing you. It's not because God has left you. It is because you have desired the things outside of God that is affecting you today. It has nothing to do with like, I, just, I just got over the God loves you. We got over that first point. He loves you. So it has nothing to do with God. It has everything to do with me and you. And when we live self-centered lives instead of God-centered lives, and our heart and our will, and when that dictates everything, it produces the things that we don't like. Selfishness. Or, or you're a person that doesn't know how to forgive or receive forgiveness, anger, all the things that I just read in Matthew chapter 15, that's where all the things begin to produce. When I live a self-centered life, where my life is no longer surrendered to God, when I, when I only desire to feed what only feeds me, what, what only makes, when, whatever makes me feel good, that is self-centered. I'm not, and here's the thing. Here's the other side of the coin. When it is God-centered, it produces the very things that you, you long for. You long for love. You long for self-control. 
You long for freedom. It produces those things when it's God-centered. And can I tell you something? A lot of times people think, oh, man, it's because when I, if I give my life to God, my life is going to be so boring. Can I tell you something? The moment I fully gave my life to Jesus, my life has never been better. Never been better. Have I had my problems? Yes. I live in a fallen, a fallen world. But my life has never been better than living a God-centered life. Never been better. And God has given me and you the power and the ability to decide how I'm going to live my life and where my heart will go. Will my heart be God-centered or will I live self-centered? What I love about Jesus in the Gospels, where it's crazy, this year, Easter's March uh, 31st, like the last Sunday of March. I don't, I don't know if I got it right, but the last Sunday of March. Usually Easter's like in April. It doesn't even feel like, it feels like Easter's coming super fast in a couple of weeks. We're going to be talking about Jesus the next couple of weeks and all those things. But what I love about Jesus in his time of ministry is that he was always giving people an invitation. It didn't matter if they were a tax collector or a prostitute. It didn't matter if they were a good person, they were married. It didn't matter. He kept telling people, come with me. Follow me. Jesus never forced anyone to do anything. He would just say, follow me. Come with me. Matthew, the tax collector, if you didn't know what a tax collector was back then, uh, if you don't like the IRS, you probably didn't like them either back then. Um, those people were ruthless. They cheated people all the time. They stole money from people all the time. Everybody hated tax collectors back then. Everybody hated them. They were ruthless people. And Jesus tells Matthew, Matthew, come, follow me. And the Bible says that Matthew stops and drops everything to follow Jesus. He didn't say, Matthew... Uh, when you get your life right, and uh, Matthew, when you, when, when you get, no, he said, come follow me. Jesus always offered the invitation, regardless of the matter of the person, regardless. So he always offered the invitation. Why? Because he wanted an increase for their life. They didn't know what they were getting into. They didn't know what was going to happen on the other side of the invitation. They just knew that this man of God was here, and they were choosing to accept the invitation. And the Bible says this is a great example, and I love this story. You can put it up there in uh, John 7, 37 through 39. Jesus says this. On the last day, the climax of the festival, Jesus stood and shouted to the crowds, Anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare, rivers of living water will flow from his heart. When he said living water, he was speaking of the spirit who would be given to everyone believing in him. But the spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet entered into his glory. Acts, the book of Acts is the fulfillment of what he says here. But Jesus says, anyone that is thirsty says, come to me, and I'm going to give you living water. So many people live this life thirsty, not just sexually thirsty. They live their life constantly perched, constantly never feeling fulfilled, constantly. It's like this. It's like this. If I were to, if me and you were playing basketball or football outside, and we're in the sun, it's, it's hot. And I'm constantly drinking Coke or whatever soda you could think of, Big Red. I don't even know if people drink Big Red anymore, but throw it there. Or your tia's favorite iced tea. Even though it feels good in the moment, it doesn't satisfy you. It tasted good. You felt a little better because it was hot. And usually Coca-Cola, when it's super cold with ice, for some reason it is glorious. It is glorious. You drank it, but it didn't do anything good for you. But you keep picking it anyways. What's going to happen? You're going to dehydrate. 
And it's the same thing with God. Jesus is saying, you've been drinking a lot of different things, but you don't have living water. And it's kind of met your need. You kind of feel good. You kind of, it's okay, but you don't have me. Because if you had me, you wouldn't stay thirsty. You wouldn't be dehydrated. You wouldn't be dying if you had me. And that's why I'm saying a desire from increase requires me and you to say yes to the invitation to follow. It requires me and you. When I live a life that is satisfied in Jesus, it'll produce something in me. If there are things in my life, church, that are, going, that are putting a wall between my increase in God, then the best thing that you can do is simply this. God, reveal that to me. Show me where the wall is because I want to increase I want to have a, I desire an increase in you. And if there's any block between me and you, God, would you reveal that? The Bible says this in, once, in Psalms 139. Look at the, what the psalmist writes. And this is a prayer that we should all pray. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. That's the kind of prayer we need, church. God, search me. Is there something in the way between me and you? Is there a wall? And if there is, would you show me, point it out in me, anything that offends you? Increase starts with you getting over the very thing that puts the wall there first. Whatever it is that's bringing decrease in your life between you and God, ask the Lord, God, would you point it out? Holy, would you show me? Point it out. Tell me what I'm doing. Because sometimes you never know. Sometimes you're doing things and you don't even know. You don't even notice. You don't even think twice about it. But it's affecting and it's bringing decrease and decrease and decrease. And it's not until God reveals it that you're like, oh my gosh, you have like this light bulb moment. And you're like, oh my gosh, I've been doing this this way for so long. And I didn't realize how wrong this was. Or, oh my gosh, you know, whatever. I don't, this attitude has been affecting whatever it is. Ask the Lord, God, would you reveal that? God, would you show me? Just like when you go to the doctor and you want the, God, the doctor to tell you everything, tell me. No, you look good. No, no, there has to be something. No, tell me. Same thing with the Lord. God, show me. Point it out in me. So that I don't have to. Continue like this. And when you live a life like that, psh, big changes happen. It produces more. It actually produces things that you really need. It produces, and we did this series in October, it produces a reverence, a fear of God in you. Not a fear like I'm afraid of God. And a, uh, a fear of God means this, that I am in awe. I value the opinions and thoughts of God over any other person. In fact, the Bible says this in Hebrews Chapter 12, verse 28. It says, since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe. That's what it produces. It produces man of, uh, uh, an, an awe of God, of saying, God, I honor you. I want to please you. It produces a dedication to God, like never before in Acts 2.42, to God and people says this, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and prayer. Right after the Holy Spirit came, this is what came out of it. This is what produced. When the living water comes, this is what it produces. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. That's what it produced. And then it produced something else. It produces you to be active in your work for God. Mark 16, verse 20. It says, and the disciples, this is after the disciples went everywhere and preached, and the Lord worked through them, confirming what they had said by many miraculous signs. Everything that I read, nowhere did you see, and it produced sadness. It produced irritability. Like those commercials, side effects are this, this, and this, and this. 
There's no side effects. It is the very opposite of the very thing that you're battling. Last thing is this, and we're done. The one to live a victorious life, number three, is we need to let his love work our faith. Let his love work our faith. The Bible says this in Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. It says, when we, when, for when we place our faith in Christ Jesus, there is no benefit in being circumcised or being uncircumcised. What is important is that faith expressing itself in love. Paul's saying this because Paul was in a battle with religious people. Again, religious people, just so you know, will be there the, your whole life. It is your job to ignore religious people as much as you can. Whether it's your grandma or whoever that wants to throw holy water at you every time you walk through the doors. They want to anoint you in your sleep and you're like with oil all over your face and you don't know how it got there. <laughs> Some of you are laughing because maybe it happened. It's okay. Jesus loves you. It's not bad to anoint. I just think it's funny when people do that. It's like excessive. He's, saying, he's battling these religious people and he's telling them, because in this situation, as you can see, everyone's an adult here. People were, the religious people were saying that you had to be circumcised to be accepted by God. And if you weren't circumcised, God couldn't accept you. And Paul's like, none of that stuff matters. Circumcision, you're not circumcised. You're going to go to heaven. So... Some of you in this room, you're going to go to heaven. That's all I'm going to say. You're going to go to heaven. He says what's most important is this, is faith expressing itself in love. There is no faith, church, without love. There is no faith without love. No matter how you slice it, there is no faith without love. It's no faith. And so when God forgives you and when God restores you, it shows me and you that God can do anything. And out of that love for me and for you, I can now live in faith because I know that God's desire for me is healing, it's wholeness. I can pray prayers like healing and I can pray for people because I know that God's desire is this. God wants people to come back to him. God wants people to be healed. God wants people to be set free. So I have faith. When I pray in faith like we did during worship, it's because I already understand that out of God's love, I can pray these prayers because that's what he desires for me. The moment that you base his ability to your goodness is the moment you lose. In other words, what I'm saying is this. If you're only going to base your life and God working only because you are good and everything's going to be better when I'm good, then you don't understand the love of God yet. God wants you, the Bible says, to come just as you are. And you're not going to leave the same, just like I talked last Sunday about the adulterous woman that he said, go and sin no more. But if you live your whole life going towards, like we did the example, like this, but always feeling like, like I have to be good. If not, I'm going to get punished. I have to get this right. If not, God's going to get, if I have to, I have to do this. It's the have to, have to, have to, have to, have to. If you're going to base your life like this, you're going to be stressed out all the time. You're going to be stressed out in your relationship with God. And you're going to be like, you know what? I give up on this God thing. I can't do it. You're right. You can't. But through Christ, you can. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, you, yes, you can. But your focus shouldn't be like, one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Your focus should be like, God, I'm going towards you. God, I love you. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to do everything I can. And I know I'm going to make it. 
And when I do fail, God, you love me. God, I'm sorry. I'm going to keep going. Yes. And I'm going to go. <laughs> Most people believe that God only moves in people's lives when they are worthy of it. And like I said, that's when we begin to tie his ability to our goodness. That's when we're worthy. That's when God can move in my life. There's a lot of you in this room that you weren't worthy when you first came to God, but God accepted you anyways. And look at you now. There's something in this room that your past, if, if God was the opposite of what I'm saying, you wouldn't make it in this room because of your past. If that's the way that it was, like Old Testament style, none of us in this room, not even me, could be standing here. I'd probably be struck dead the moment I walked up in here because I was unholy. But through God, it's a different story. God has a better way for me and you.